Richard Wolf here. For some of us, we listen faithfully on um, Fridays for the economic update. And I think the thing, this is going to sound a little odd. First of all, there's a saying up in the north of Ireland, I don't know about anywhere else, but if you're real smart, they say you've got brains to learn. <laughs> and the man standing in front of you, embarrassing that it is, has so many brains to burn, we wouldn't run out of fuel for the whole winter, and I know I'm sorry to embarrass you. This man, I, I don't want you to say to nothing about your background, but there's so much that is really very rich about it. And one of the things that really affects me as a listener is that no one would ever know that. You're so pure in your presentation. And before on that show, I mean, that might sound like it's too much to say over the top, but I feel very much like I don't feel like a stupid person when we hear you on the radio. And um, the thing I was wanting to say is before the meeting, Professor Wolf said, my dad went one time and spoke at the Catholic River and I was little and he took me and in our house, he said, we're not Catholic, but Dorothy was like a saint. And I want to say, you are, to me, the most, whatever Marxist saint I know who's still living. And we welcome you tonight and ask you to hear. So let me tell you a little bit um, about the American economy and where it is. I figure that's probably the most important thing most of you might want to know about, either because you have to make a living or you're a student and imagine that you can, in the future, make a living. Uh, before I start, I have to always ask you to be kind to me. <laughs> what I mean is, I'm just the messenger. And you have to remember, even if you don't like the message, don't take it out on the messenger. Just bring in the message. I'm going to describe to you an economy that's going to upset you. If you don't like hearing about it, there's an easy solution. If you don't like hearing about it, there's an easy solution. Close your ears and go back to watching television. Then you will not be distressed by what's happening until it bites you right in the nose. So let me present that to you as bluntly as I can and then take a step back and try to explain it. I'm a left winger, I'm proud of it and happy about it, and I've been that most of my life. I went to the fanciest schools the United States has, um, just out of luck. Uh, since I don't come from wealthy family, but my, my friends in the colleges where I went were all people who came from the right families. Uh, I didn't. Um, they would occasionally take me home for Thanksgiving or something, and it was a very important lesson to me as I understand just how poor my family was by comparing it to the way they took me home. One of my classmates at Yale, which is where I got my PhD, was a woman named Janet Yellen. You get the, get the idea. I could give you many more. Uh, I know all these people because it's a relatively small number of folks. I went to Harvard before I went to Yale. It's like a joke. <laughs> Between those two, I went to Stanford University. <laughs> That's the only places I went. I, I was condemned to 10 years in the Ivy League. <laughs> and I survived. I've often thought of making a little t-shirt saying, I survived the Ivy League. You know, the way some people have a t-shirt says, I survived Catholic school. <laughs> <laughs> And I imagine that similar kinds of problems to justify those kinds of shirts. I didn't learn much. I was saying before, it's hard to get that across to Americans. They really do want to believe that something special happens in those institutions. It doesn't. It never did. That's the place where wealthy people send their children. And then there's a few of us who, who slither in on top of that often kind of by a wild mistake or somebody didn't understand what was happening. But it's been very useful for me. Uh, I didn't learn all that much, but I got those pedigrees. And every time I've encountered difficulty with what I have to say, as you'll see this evening, 
I wave my pedigree, and people back away. It's a little bit like waving garlic when the devil comes and <laughs> backs them off. I, I wave pedigree, backs people off, they leave me alone, and I can function. So I'm an economist. I went to school to be an economist. I wanted to be an economist. I wanted to understand how the economy works. It was very important to me. I loved history. I loved understanding how society worked. But I could never kind of understand it because I was never taught the economics, which over time I began to realize were kind of what makes it all happen, what makes the world go around. So I began to be critical of my professors because they kind of left that stuff out. So I took economics courses, naively imagining that they would teach that to me there. They didn't. And so I realized I'd have to learn it myself. There were other students like me, so we kind of got together and we taught ourselves. And that's how I survived. I did everything I was supposed to to get my degree and all of that. And I've been a professor as a result all the rest of my life. Professor of economics, I teach here at the new school uh, as an occasional visiting professor, they call it. But I used to teach full-time. Taught at Yale for a while. I taught at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. So led a perfectly normal, academic kind of life. But always with this difference. I didn't think capitalism was the best thing since sliced bread. I've never thought that. From my time as a student, I would raise my hand and ask about this problem or that problem. And I never got a decent answer. Most of the time, my professors were upset and uncomfortable by my question. And they showed it. And I'm not stupid. I knew that in order to get the A, which my parents told me was my job in life, I would have to please these professors. So I didn't push it. I just went off on my own. And I said, OK, I'm going to learn it by myself. And what I wanted was criticism of capitalism. I wanted people to teach me whether there was something to these ideas I had, that the system wasn't so well organized, and that the system wasn't fair, and the other things I was thinking. But I wanted someone to show me, maybe I'm wrong about that, okay, I'll learn. Uh, but if I'm right, I'd like to see the better argument than I could make. That's how you learn. And pretty soon, this is part of what I want to talk to you about this evening, pretty soon I found my way as all people like this do, to the works of Karl Marx. <coughs> Only because this was where, in a sense, it all starts, where the critique of capitalism is what this man is about and what the people inspired by him are about. And so if you want to learn a critical perspective on capitalism, of course you have to learn that stuff. You don't have to agree with it, but if you want a critical perspective, well, then that's what you have to do, and you have to read, because that's the most developed global tradition of criticism of capitalism that exists. Even if you didn't want to learn a critical perspective, remember with me, the largest country by geography on this planet, Russia. The largest country by population on this planet, China. And over the last hundred years, People calling themselves Marxists have been in charge of those two countries. If for no other reason, you kind of ought to find out a little bit about what they think and how they make sense of economic issues. It'd be kind of stupid not to do that. Let me give you another way of understanding it. Suppose there was a family next door to you, and you uh, wanted to understand that family. Maybe your school teacher asked you to write a paper about a family near you. And you knew there was a mother, a father, and two kids. And you happen to know, because they live near you, that one of the kids thinks this is the best family you could ever have. And the other one thinks this is a psychological horror story. This family. <laughs> okay? I know that would never happen to any of us. Other people have that kind of thing. So if you wanted to understand the family, would you talk to only one of the children? Well, I think most of you understand. Of course not. You talk to both children, get their perspectives, and then draw your own conclusions as to who made the better case or however you worked it out. But you wouldn't begin by closing yourself off to one of the two perspectives, either one. Because that's, that's stupid. 
That's childish. That's dumb. If you understand what I just said, now let me give you the parallel. For the last half century in the United States, in economics, taught in the university, they didn't ask the two children, they asked only one. In my education, Harvard, Stanford, and Yale, and believe me, it's like what I'm about to describe there, you can imagine what it is everywhere else. I was never assigned one word of Karl Marx, any of those institutions, <laughs> ever, ever. When the issue of Marx came up, which wasn't often, it would be breezily dismissed by whoever the teacher was as beneath needing to read anything. It was from da -da 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 -da. Mumble about Stalin or dictatorship <laughs> or something that would allow you to quickly get rid of this. Now what drives that? There's no economic justification for it. There's no intellectual justification. There's no educational justification. It's dumb and it's stupid and it's backward. It's the kind of thing that happens in societies with rigid censorship. <coughs> the weird thing in America was there was no rigid censorship, didn't need one. The people of this country and their institutions self-censored. They didn't need to have the government come down. I mean, it did every now and then, but it wasn't necessary. My professors thought that was the way the world worked. Of course you ignored all of that. They weren't unaware that if you were interested in Marx, it wouldn't do your career any good. You better keep that to yourself. Sure, that was going on. But we did that as a nation out of fear. A fear so deep in the Cold War that not only were you taught to hate everything Russian or Chinese or anything like that, but you were taught it was important not to know anything about the intellectual tradition, the theoretical work, to understand that those people had been engaged in. For those of you who don't know, and believe me, I, I travel around the country, I give a lot of talks. When I explain to people that Marx was not Russian, it comes as a shock. <laughs> That Marx never went to Russia. My God. <laughs> that there was no Soviet Union until long after Marx was dead. Etc., etc. He's not Chinese either, if any of you are <laughs> wondering. We are now coming out of a 50 year hibernation, this country. We are very backward. When I go to Europe, I encounter people who have been studying and reading Marx since they were adults. It's part of the tradition. The German government, hardly a left-wing situation today, is conducting all through Germany and around the world celebrations of what? The 200th anniversary of the birth of Karl Marx. Because in Germany, he's a cultural hero. Germany is a capitalist country. They're real proud that the major thinker of the criticism of capitalism is one of them, even though they hounded him out of the country and made him live most of his life in England. But they now want to recapture this person they exiled. When Marx was, when Marx was a young man, he was critical of German culture, society, and in those days, the government didn't kill you or imprison you. They exiled you. It was the preferred form. So they basically said to Marx, you got to leave. Uh, they didn't give him much choice. By the way, there's a, a new film around. If you're interested in that part of Marx's life, it's called The Young Karl Marx. It's playing in theaters here in New York. It's worth seeing. I didn't think I would say it. I wanted to see it. I was very pleasantly surprised. Um, Marx is actually, hold on to your hat, a sympathetic character. You kind of like him. And he has a really nice wife. And you like her too. And, this will really throw they like each other. It's really unusual, all things considered. So we have a society in which we have unlearned what we knew before World War II. Marxism was alive in this country. A lot of Marxists did all kinds of work back then. Even affected people like, I don't know, Dorothy Day, <laughs> among others. But 
But after the war, with, this, with the Cold War, we erased awareness of an entire intellectual tradition. Out of fear, we didn't study what? The criticisms. You don't understand the criticisms of something. You don't understand it. It's not enough to simply look at the people who love it. I think it's hard to read and study the people who love capitalism. Sure, that's one way to get at an understanding. But if you've got half a brain, you have to also take a look at the people who don't like it, who are critical. See what they have to say, and then make up your own mind. But you're not going to make up your mind in any useful way by refusing to engage all of the other part. When I said to you earlier with other students, I went to learn on my own, that's what I did. I read Marx and Marxists. They're in the library, so you can still get them. That's what we did. And the more we read, the more angry we became at the utter unjustification, lack of justification, for having excluded this from our learning, from our reading, from our studies. We weren't being trained to understand economics. We were being trained to celebrate capitalism. That's what economics departments in the United States do, 99% of them. They did it when I was a student, and they're doing it now. They've learned nothing, nothing. I wish I could tell you otherwise, but I can't. They exclude Marx and Marxists every chance they get. Sure, there are a few exceptions. Me. <laughs> and I'm not the only one, heaven knows. But in general, no. They don't want to know about it. They don't want to hear about it. And if you're wondering about how poorly the government of the United States these days is handling the crash, you know the crash, the thing that happened in 2008 that we're still stuck in? That thing which has shaped your life more than most other economic forces of the last decade. That thing about which you don't really understand all that much. You know why it's not being solved? Because the people in charge are a generation who never studied the critique of capitalism, who therefore have no equipment with which to understand what's going on and to fix it. Because it was so important to pretend that there is no criticism, that there is no problem, Come on, folks. In a way, what I'm about to tell you, you already know. That's what happens in a country that shuts things out. People kind of know. But they know it's not smart to go where you're not supposed to go. So they know and don't know at the same time. The kind of weird mentality which we Americans have. Boy, do we have it. So let me tell you what that means. Because I went to these fancy schools, because I tried very hard to succeed there, and by most standards I did, I have a good number of friends, personal friends, who are right-wing economists, middle-of-the-road economists, and lefties like me. And we get together from time to time, have a cup of coffee, or a beer, or a dinner, or something, and we chat. And I want to tell you about a remarkable reality. We don't agree on how we got into the situation the United States is in now, and we don't agree on how to get out. We don't. But we agree on the following sense. This is the worst condition of the American economy, in a disaster of an economy, but we believe everything is okay. This is a recipe for the worst possible outcome. Let me give you some of the signs of it. And there are thousands of them. I'm just going to pick the first ones that come to my mind. Yesterday, the President of the United States went on TV and the radio and explained that in order to create jobs in America, remember with me, we have very low unemployment, so why is that so urgent? Yeah. Put, put aside. In order to create jobs, he is going to put tariffs on steel and aluminum. Here's what that means. A ton of steel, let's say it costs $100, comes into the United States from other parts of the world. 
We buy it from other parts of the world because they make it either cheaper or better quality or often both. So we buy it from them. The largest shipper of steel to the United States is Canada. The second largest shipper of steel to the United States is the European Union. China, about which Mr. Trump spoke a lot, is the 11th smallest shipper of steel. China, steel, have nothing to do with each other. They're irrelevant. If you put a tariff, it's like a tax. It means that the $100 steel per ton will now cost Americans $125 because in addition to paying the 100 for the steel, you gotta pay $25, a 25% tax to Uncle Sam. And the whole purpose here is what? To make it desirable for Americans who don't wanna now suddenly pay $125 for steel to switch to an American company which charges normally 110 because the American company used to charge 110 for steel, that's why we all bought foreign steel for 100, because it was 10% cheaper, right? But now that the tariff is attached, the American companies can raise the price of steel from the 110, which couldn't compete with the rest of the world, to 124, one buck cheaper than what it costs to bring it in. Which means suddenly, overnight, these steel and all aluminum companies are gonna make a much more money in the mind of Mr. Trump, I'm being relaxed about words like mine. <laughs> in the mind of Mr. Trump, this means that these, there'll be more profit for these companies and they will hire more workers. I said, make jobs. That's what he said. If he did that in an economics class, even in this poor backward country, he'd flunk. Let me explain to you why. Come from anybody. What else will happen if the price of steel goes up, which I just showed you how it will? Imported steel will now cost $125, and American steel will cost $124, which is a lot more than the 100 we used to pay. Well, let's see. Who buys steel? I know automobile companies. The car is made, lots of steel is in that car. There's steel in your toaster, there's steel in a, every building, there's, you get the picture. Well, they're all, all those companies are going to have to pay much more for the steel they buy, and that means they're going to have to raise the prices, which, ready, you all have to pay. And you all don't have the money to pay those higher prices, which means you'll buy fewer of those things, which means they'll lay off the people who make them. Do you understand? This is so simple, so basic, that you have to conclude that the President of the United States is either crazy, or the policy people working with him are crazy, or they think the people of America are so stupid that they won't get any of this. These are signs of social decay. I don't care what the answer is. It doesn't matter. This is a society that's not able to function anymore. The very fact we put a man like that in president, forget what he does, is a sign of a system that isn't working well. Last year, 65,000 Americans died by overdose of opioids. Come on, folks. You don't need to be a deep psychologist to understand this is a country in deep trouble. <coughs> Every week we read of somebody going into a school or a church or a parking lot and shooting large numbers of people they don't know. What? No other country on earth has an overdose problem like ours. No other country on earth has a shooting problem like ours. Nobody's close. The country's blowing up. It can't function. Let me give you another example. In December, the Congress of the United States passed a tax law, changed the taxes in America. Let's go together, you and me, through what this was about. The first and most important and largest part of this tax bill was very simple. It reduced 
the income tax for corporations. You know how you pay a tax on your wages and salaries, as we all do? Well, corporations do a little calculus. They take the revenues they get from selling whatever they make, they subtract the cost of doing that, the materials and the electricity and the labor they pay, and the difference, the net revenue, is what they pay a tax on, a tax on their profits, a tax on corporate income. That was dropped from 35%, which is what it was before December, to 21%. That is a 40% cut in the taxes on corporations. That's stupefying. In one year. And it was passed that this, this cut would be, I kid you not, the word was permanent. It would last forever. And by the way, it's a sign of political lunacy that your, what you do in your particular moment of history will last forever. Go, go look at ancient ruins and you'll see how serious that idea is. But it's permanent. <laughs> then they made very small income tax cuts for individuals, <laughs> which they made, ready, temporary. Just to make sure you understand, the corporations are getting something big. You are getting something small. Theirs is permanent, yours is temporary. But that would be unspeakable just by itself. Treating corporations like this. But it comes in 2017, after 40 years during which corporations have done better than they ever did before in American history, in which the rich have gotten much, much richer because they get their cuts of the corporate income. Normally, you would help the corporations if they've had a hard time, but they haven't. They've had the time of their lives. That's why the stock market is up in the last 30 years in a way that it never saw before. We just gave a tax bonanza to people who had already become richer than ever before in American history. It's grotesque in the minds of anybody who pays any attention to this. What in the world are we doing? I live on 6th Avenue and 15th Street, not all that far from here. When I moved here in 2003, every store on 6th Avenue that I would walk by had a tenant in it, it was functioning, and there were no people on the street. Now, I step over people on my way out of my building to walk down 6th Avenue where every third or fourth store is sitting empty, in some cases, for years. I walk by them every day. What recovery? What are you talking about? I sat in a Starbucks, the one on the corner of 14th Street and 6th Avenue, right near where I live, not so long ago. And I went in there having my <laughs> cup of coffee, and it was kind of empty place. And a young woman comes in. She's sort of shy, I guess 21, 22 years old. And she looks around nervously, and she walks up to the fellow who makes the coffee. And he very sweetly says, what, you know, what can I make for you? And she says she doesn't want a coffee. Could he give her an application form? She wants a job. And a, a nice young African-American fellow, very kind to her. He says to her, do you mind if I ask you a question? Very polite, very almost nurturing of her. And she says, sure. Do you have your BA degree? And she's embarrassed. No, she explains. I'm sitting right there, so I'm part of the conversation, even though I'm not in it. She explains she had to stop her education to get a job and make some money so she can go back and finish her education. That's why she's there. He listens very politely, and he says, listen, I'll take your application, fill it out, go sit over there. But I'm telling you, if you don't have a BA, they're not going to hire you. Let me say that to you again. To stand beside behind that counter and press six buttons in alternating patterns does not require a bachelor's degree from a college. Never did, 
never will. Starbucks is doing that because it can, because there's a generation of young people who need jobs who have to get any job they can, and so they do. That's not the sign of a healthy economy, that's a sign of an economy in deep, deep trouble. I could go on and on, but these are the real signs. Let me even deal with a couple that you might find difficult. The unemployment rate, roughly about 5% now. Why is it 5%? Is it because people who were unemployed got jobs? The answer is no. Let me explain to you. Of course, if there was proper literacy in economics, you'd all know what I'm about to say. And maybe some of you do, but my guess is most of you don't. Don't worry, I won't ask you to raise your hand. Here's how we do that in America. Every month, we ask questions. The government runs around and asks questions. They ask randomly collected people, do you have a job? Are you working? If you answer yes, you're considered to be an employed person. If you answer no, I'm not working right now, you're asked the second question. Are you looking for work? If you answer the question yes, you are considered to be an unemployed person. That is, you don't have a job, but you are looking. If you answer that second question with the no, I'm not looking, you are not counted as a member of the labor force. You are not an unemployed person. So now, just with me, this is not complex math. If from one month to the next, a million people who are looking give up because they're not prepared to be turned down yet another time, so they answer the question, a million of them. I'm not looking anymore. The unemployment rate will go down because they're no longer unemployed, they're out of the labor force. That's what we have, folks. We have a record number of people that are not in the labor force. You know what that means? It means that the rest of us who are, are working to produce the goods and services that a growing number of people are not helping to produce because they don't have a job and they're not even looking anymore. We are in the process, because we will not face that our economy doesn't work real well, to say the least. We're in the process now of doing what countries do when their economic system fails them, but they can't face it. They don't know how, they don't want to. What does that mean? We're looking for scapegoats, somebody to blame, something to attack and be angry at, to distract us from looking at a system that doesn't work for us. Let's go through the ones that are big in our country right now. This is an old, ugly story. Immigrants. Oh boy, let's beat up on immigrants. Let's tell ourselves a crazy story that the immigrants are the problem. This country has 325 million people in it. You know how many undocumented immigrants we have? 11 million. Do it, friends. 11 million out of 325. You really think that the 325 are having a hard time because of something done by 11 of them? Stop. It is too stupid for words. But it flies in this country. It allows you to be angry at who? At the poorest people in the community. They're the bad guys. Oh, let's go get them, and what? Throw them back to where? To Mexico. Mexico is a country where the army can't go to half the country because it is too weak to fight against the drug armies, which are composed of all the people in Mexico who can't get a job. What we're sending them is an army of new recruits. Is this crazy? Uh-huh. And what does that tell you? A society that's out of control, that doesn't understand what it's doing, that is flailing around, desperately trying to come up with something that doesn't require them to look at how the system works and for whom it works. If you're in the top 10% of the United States, you're doing fine. 
This system works for you. It did in the past, and it's doing a fine job now. Bear with me, folks. In 2008, this capitalist system crashed. And the fundamental reason it crashed is because it ripped apart this society. We had built up, after the Great Depression, we had built up a society with what we call a large middle class. Millions of Americans who had a kind of decent job, who, where the wages went up a little every year, that they could kind of have a home and a car. You know, the American dream, the whole bit. But starting in the 1970s, we took that away from them. We took it away. How did we do that? By the normal functions of a capitalist system. The big businesses in the United States, who had grown big and powerful over the last 150 years in America, had had along the way to make deals with the working class. That's what the unions were about. That's what the IWW was about. That's what the Catholic Worker and many other organizations helped to develop a working class that could get decent wages and benefits. And the corporations had to pay those wages. They were never happy about it. It's not how capitalism works. If you go to the Master of Business Administration program and get your MBA, you'll learn that one of the first rules of a business is to economize on labor costs. What that means is hire a cheaper worker in place of an expensive one, buy a machine, automate that job out of existence, and if you can't do that, bring in an immigrant, pay him or her less, and if you can't do that, move to where the cheap workers are and produce there. Starting in the 1970s, because of the jet engine and the internet, it became real easy to move for people to come here and for companies to leave. And most of the big companies left. That's why your socks today are made in China. And so is everything else you're wearing. And pretty soon, most of what you're driving and most of what, you know, toasting your bread in the morning, etc., it's all made someplace else because the work is cheap there. You know what the minimum wage in Bangladesh is? $38 a month. How are you going to compete with that? <coughs> what kind of a ruler is that for a capitalist? My God, I can close the factory in Jamaica, Queens, and I can move to Shanghai or to Dakar, Bangladesh, and I can get those t-shirts made by somebody I got to pay $38 a month when in America to come for $38 a day. So they left. These loyal, patriotic, flag-waving American businesses kissed us all off. Goodbye. I'm leaving. And they left in droves. And they took the jobs with them. And there aren't jobs for Americans anymore the way they were. That's how Mr. Trump got elected, by talking about that. He at least talked about it. The other fakers don't even do that. Excuse me, the other political leaders. <laughs> should be more polite. So they left. But they, the businesses that couldn't leave brought cheap people in from Central and Latin America, large number, and from other parts of the world, for sure. And when they couldn't solve their problems of making more money by either leaving or bringing cheap labor in, they automated. That's called the computer revolution, or robotics, or any of that stuff. Artificial intelligence. This is just ways of saving on labor costs. And we've been saving on labor costs since the 1970s, which is why the, the young people have no jobs. That's why that story about the Starbucks I gave you, that's where that comes from. That's why we have a whole generation of millennials who are still trying to cope with the reality that everything they were told to expect in the way of a job and income isn't there anymore. And they go through such conniptions to try not to confront what that means. In the aftermath of the disappearance of jobs in the 70s and 80s, Wages stopped rising. Some of you have heard me go through this. For 150 years, from 1820 to 1970, wages in America, real wages, what you could afford to buy, went up. 
That's why Americans believe that they live in a special place where every generation will live better than the one before. All of that stuff really went on here for a while. In the 1970s, it stopped. It has never resumed. The wage you get today, the average American wage, in terms of what you can afford to buy, what we call in economics the real wage, where you adjust the money you get for the prices you have to pay. The real average wage in America today is about what it was in the late 1970s. That's what you're earning in America. Every year since then, Americans have become more productive. More productive means the worker produces more for the employer for every hour he or she works. But over those 35 years, where we were becoming more productive for the employer, the employer was paying us the same. You don't need a PhD. I have one, but you don't need it. If what you give the employer goes up every year and what he gives you stays the same, oh boy, is it going to be a good time for him. Not for you. For you, you've got a new problem you never had before in America. Since the 1970s, you can't offer your children a college education, a car, a home, the American dream. You know why? Because you're not earning the money to be able to buy all that stuff. So Americans, not understanding any of this, because in order to get it, you have to have a critical attitude towards what's going on, which is what we don't teach. Americans didn't understand, so they reacted individually to the disappearance of the jobs, to the stagnant wages, to the end of income growth. What did Americans do starting in the 1970s? First thing they did was more labor. If you don't get more per hour, do more hours. The husband has a second job, a third job. And the biggest thing that shaken America to this day, the women, particularly the white women, black women had been working outside the home for a long time. But white women had it. And starting in the 1970s, we took the white woman population of this country and we told them, whatever you're doing at home, for your husband, for your children, for your elderly, you're now going to have to have a job outside the house, too. Try that on. 40 hours a week, just like the husband. Because there's no way this family's going to afford anything it promised itself or its children unless that happens. You want to have any part of that American dream? Out she goes. And then what? We got surprised. We got surprised that making a woman remain responsible for the overwhelming bulk of housework while also doing a full-time job is asking something a human being can't do. And we began to see the results. We're still seeing them. But if you never thought of it this way, that's because you don't have a critical perspective, which no one ever taught you. Here's some of the results. We have the highest divorce rate in the United States, in the world, the United States. That started in the 1970s, we went nuts. Why? Because the exhausted woman from her job comes home, she wants a husband to do for her what the husband wanted her to do for him. But she can't, and he can't cope with the fact that she can. And their whole definitions are changing. And she's got a sense of herself outside that she didn't develop when she was only at home. And she now has expectations, and she's meeting new interesting people, more interesting than that husband. <laughs> uh, he has to cope. We can laugh all we want, but this deadly serious stuff, as you all know. American women consume more psychotropic drugs than any population on the planet. Way more than men. And way more than people in any other country. You either have to believe that American women are inherently junkies, <laughs> or, which I, that's what it deserves, it? or they're under some extraordinary pressure. I vote for the second one. Yeah, they're under extraordinary pressure. We also have, among the young people here, you can testify, if you allow yourself to think about it, a generation of kids that could not get from their parents what they needed, because the parents were in an impossible situation, and the tensions are working themselves out in myriad ways, including the opioid crisis. Come on, you do know. 
what I'm talking about. Americans now do more hours of paid labor than anyone else. Europeans, on average, have 20% less hours a year of labor. Do you understand what that means? A day less a week that they work in terms of hours. They make as much as we do, in some cases more. They just work a lot less because they insist on that as part of their self-definition. We don't have that in America. But doing more labor didn't solve the problem. It turned out that when the women went out to work, they needed more things to buy. The women had to have another separate set of clothes. You can't wear at the office what you wear at home, usually. And you needed a second car, because we don't have a public transportation system worth anything in most parts of the country, not New York City, but most other parts. So you had to get a car. So the money that the women worked, they had to kind of spend to enable them to work. So it couldn't solve the problem. So the American people did a second thing. You know what that is, too. What did they do to allow them to buy the American dream, even though their wages didn't go up? Come on. That's it. Loans. We became pioneers, we Americans. Only this time, not in a covered wagon going across the prairie. We became pioneers because no working class in the history of the world ever borrowed this amount of money in this short a period of time. Do you know that before the 1970s, credit cards were something that business travelers used? The American Express card, nobody else. There was no MasterCard Visa in everybody's pocket, let alone a dozen of them. We had to develop new ways to load the mass of people up with a debt they couldn't afford. Do you understand? That's how it was done. We faked ourselves out by borrowing. Now here again comes a non-difficult math problem. If your wages are flat and the debts you have go up, it's only a matter of time before you will not have enough money to service the debt, to pay the interest and the payback that has to happen. That, when that moment came, we call that 2008. That's when the House of Cards collapses. No mystery at all. And there's no solution. Have wages gone up since the crash of 2008? Not at all. But people can't borrow because they can't even pay what they already had in the way of debts. So we had nothing. There's no, nothing happened out of that crisis. Nothing got changed. Which is why the next one is already coming down the pike. We don't know exactly when. No one knows exactly when. But that it's coming. We didn't do anything to change the basic dynamic that brought us to one in 2008. Because we are engaged in a massive program of denial. It's all all right. It's all working out. And if it was all working out, we wouldn't be putting tariffs on steel and aluminum. We wouldn't do any of those things. Do you know that every major trading partner in the United States, in the 24 hours since Trump announced it, has announced that they're going to retaliate? You know what that means? They're going to put tariffs on the goods Americans want to sell in their country. We, we're not the only ones who can play this game. Maybe that never crossed Mr. Trump's mind. Again, I'm using the term mind loosely, okay? Maybe it never crossed their mind, but the, the rest of the world is helping us by saying, oh, you're going to solve your problem by sticking it to us. Well, watch us. We're going to solve our problem by sticking it to you. You know, in the past in history, these things called trade wars, which, by the way, today Mr. Trump added to his stature in the world by announcing that trade wars, I quote you now, are good. He said that, that trade wars are good. Every course in economics ever taught, in my experience, says the opposite. But they're all wrong. Mr. Trump sees clearly. In the past, trade wars have a nasty habit of becoming military wars. What you can't fix by these manipulations, you then are tempted to believe you can fix by invading or bombing or something else like very dangerous games being played with your life. Americans keep thinking that horrors like Yemen only happen far away. Very dangerous idea. The United States is more and more vulnerable. 
Don't be silly. All right, last part. I want to go back to the beginning, to this stuff with Marx. Marx was a critic of capitalism. It might be interesting for you to understand why he was. Because it will make you feel closer to him. And that's something I'm interested in promoting. <laughs> Marx was a child, you might say, of the French Revolution. Marx was born in 1818, about 50 years after 1789, or less. 1789 was the French Revolution. The slogans of the French Revolution were liber liberty, equality, fraternity. Okay? For Marx, like for the whole young generation of Europeans, this was the end of feudalism, this was the beginning of a new world, this was capitalism that would bring us liberty, equality, brotherhood, fraternity. He hoped for that. He believed in that with his whole generation. But as he grew to adulthood in the 1830s and 40s, we're now 50 years after, he looks around Europe and he reaches the following conclusion. We did overthrow feudalism in the French Revolution, the American Revolution too. We brought in capitalism. But it didn't bring with it the way we thought it would, liberty, equality, and fraternity. Because when I look around here in Europe in the middle of the 19th century, equality is nowhere to be found, liberty, a joke, and fraternity, don't even think about it. You know what the 1840s are? It's like what you may remember from reading the novels of Charles Dickens. Remember? Oliver Twist and David Copperfield or Emil Zola. What the conditions of life were like there. Liberty, equality, fraternity, not even close. So Marx asks himself the question, what happened? I feel betrayed, he said. I heard all these hopes that capitalism would come together with liberty, equality, and fraternity. You could add democracy. We got the capitalism, but the promise of liberty, equality, fraternity, and democracy, we didn't get. What happened? That, that's his life's work. What happened? How do we explain that we were wrong about something, and what happened, and what do we do about it? And when he finished his studies, mostly done in England, in English, in London, he reached this powerful conclusion. Capitalism came into the world promising liberty, equality, fraternity, and democracy. It's there in the statements of the French revolutionaries. It's there in the 1774 Declaration of Independence and so forth. Those things were promised as parts of what capitalism would mean for us. But my research shows me that not only is capitalism not able to bring us those things, but capitalism is the reason why we don't have those things. It's a system that systematically prevents liberty, equality, fraternity, and democracy. And he showed how that is, how that works. He analyzed the capitalist system, particularly in the three volumes of Capital, his mature work, he shows how that works. And I am going to do it in the next five minutes. <laughs> Ready? Well, I've read all that stuff. I can, it's like Reader's Digest. You know, I can give you a, I'll give you a capsule. Here we go. Here we go. And I'm going to use an example that probably is part of every one of your lives. Imagine you go in for a job. You talk to an employer. You sit down and you chat about what the job is, and what you're going to have to do, and where you're going to sit, and all that. And then you get to that kind of thorny part, you know, how much am I going to get paid? And let's suppose the employer says to you, uh, for this job, I offer you $20 an hour. You have to come at 8 o'clock, and you stay until 5, and you do this and that, and I will give you, at the end of Friday, every Friday, I will give you uh, $20 for each hour, let's say 40, uh, per week that you work. <coughs> Marx says, now let's look at that. And Marx really, if you read him right, is saying, I'm going to teach you something about that that you already know 
but don't want to face. Here we go. The only reason that employer is ever going to pay you $20 an hour is if during that hour, your labor, your use of your brains and your muscles, adds more stuff to what he has to sell at the end of the week than $20 worth. Your labor has to give him more than $20, because that way when he sells it, he'll get, let's say, $25. So he'll sell what you did in that hour for $25, give you 20, because that's the deal, and he keeps the five. That's his profit. Well, what that means is, says Mark, that the only way you will ever get a job paying you anything is if you produce more for your employer than he gives you. Every time you've looked in the mirror and said to yourself, I will never work for anyone who doesn't pay me what I'm worth, you don't understand the system you're in. You're never going to get what you're worth because that's how the system works. That's how it has always worked. So for those of you who at the end of a working day on occasion, while walking home, had a vague feeling, you kind of wondered where it came from. You had this vague feeling of being somehow, I don't know, ripped off. <laughs> Marx is here to tell you, exactly, you got it in that moment. No wonder on the way home, after a feeling like that, you need to go into an establishment which promises you a happy hour. <laughs> it's a real good admission that the earlier ones worked. <laughs> Come on, you do know. You know real well. You know what Marx called that extra that you give the employer over what he gives you? He called that the surplus. And then he taught us something very profound. He said, compare capitalism to slavery for a minute. In slavery, we can see kind of clearly there's two groups of people. There's the slaves and there's the masters. The slaves work all day and do all the work, grow the crops, raise the animals, make the pots and pans and crafts and all the rest. And it all belongs to the master, as does the slave himself. But the master isn't stupid, wants this game to continue. So he takes up, here we go, takes a portion of what the slaves have produced and gives it back to the slave and say, here, eat this, wear this, because I need you to come back tomorrow to do this again. Of course, the master doesn't give the slave everything. The system wouldn't function that way. No, he gives him only as much as he needs to get the slave to keep functioning, and the rest, the difference between what the slave produces and what you give him back, that's the surplus that the master lives off. Ah, says Marx. Now let's look at feudalism. They have a ward and a serf. Same deal. The serf works on his land, produces a bunch of stuff, keeps a bunch for himself on his land with his family, but he has to deliver to the Lord a portion of his product, which they called in feudal Europe the word rent. Clue. Clue. So the serf produces a surplus which accrues to the Lord. Now Marx says, here's the answer to the mystery. Capitalism made a revolution, overthrew slavery, like in the United States. Capitalism overthrew feudalism, like in France. And it promised it would bring in a new world of liberty, equality, democracy, fraternity. But you know what? It was deluded. It didn't get rid of surplus production by the many for the few. It just changed the form. You know, no slaves, no serfs. But we have a new system called employer, employee, same game. That's why you will always produce more than you get paid, because otherwise that job isn't there for you. Capitalism isn't the break from the old. It's just another form, and we have to do what? We have to take another step. My last point. The other step is we got to finally break 
from a system, slavery, feudalism, capitalism, in which the many produce a surplus taken and used by the few to stay on top. And the only way to do that is to reorganize production so there aren't a few people doing all the order giving and a mass of people doing all the order taking. Or to use simple modern English, no more capitalist enterprise with a board of directors and shareholders at the top, a tiny group of people. For those of you who don't know, 10% of shareholders in America own 84% of the shares. So shareholding is a tiny, highly concentrated part of the population. The way you get on a board of directors of any corporation is you're elected by the shareholders. That's how you get there. And the way it works is one share, one vote. If you own a million shares, you get a million votes. If you own 11 shares left to you by your grandmother, that's how many votes you get. And if you have no shares, you get no votes at all. This is a system that can only be defined in one way, fundamentally undemocratic. There's no pretense in the workplace of capitalism where we all have a participation in the decisions that affect our lives. When you walk across the threshold of your factory, your office, your store, you give up on democracy. And you always have a tiny group of people at the top tell you what to do. Sit here, work with this machine, do it this way, do it this way. At the end of the day, go home, leave here what you've produced, and if you take it home with you, we will arrange for people in blue outfits to come to your house and hurt you. And you all know it. There is no democracy in capitalism in the workplace. There never was. That's why it's not a surprise that it didn't bring democracy. This is a system that excludes it in the workplace. And the workplace is an interesting place to exclude it because the workplace is where adults spend most of their lives. If you had an honest commitment to democracy, you would have put it there in the first place. What possible good is it to have a democracy in the town where you live if the workplace that you really depend on is so fundamentally anti-democratic? The United States is fighting wars in Yemen, in Iraq, in Afghanistan under the claim we're bringing democracy to these countries. You can't bring what you don't have. We don't have it. And Marx was the first one to say, not only don't we have it, but take a look at the consequences. Let me conclude with that. We allow the production system of the United States, the system, the factories, the offices, the stores, that produce and distribute the goods we all depend on, our clothing, our food, our shelter, all of this. We allow that production to be in the hands of a tiny group of people, major shareholders and boards of directors. And what? We are then surprised, since they are the ones in charge, that they take the bulk of the revenue produced by them for themselves. What the hell did you expect them to do? Dish it out to you, because you're nice. It's not how the system works. You want an economic system that serves the people, you've got to put the people in charge. If you don't, you won't get it, and you've got no one to blame but yourself. You allow it. It can't work if you don't allow it. It's the fundamental understanding behind trade union movement, behind socialist and communist parties, behind movements like the Catholic worker, among many. In the end, what are we doing allowing a system structured this way that delivers the goods to a tiny number of people at the expense of everybody else, and we sit here scratching our heads wondering, gee, how did it work out this way? If you have ever read Marx, you wouldn't have to scratch your head. You know very well why it works this way. And the only remaining problem is, why do people allow it? Why does the mass of people allow a system as undemocratic, unjust, unequal as this to keep on going? Lest you think this is hopeless, a final comment. Look what I've just been saying to you. Pretty heavy. Up until 10 years ago, not even, up until eight years ago, 
I couldn't say this around the United States. I'd get myself into too much trouble, even with my pedigrees. I couldn't. It was considered blasphemy or worse. It was considered too much. The last eight years, everything has changed. Everything. Last week I spoke in San Francisco and Sonoma. Sonoma, it's yuppie central. <laughs> Big audiences in, in Berkeley. I spoke to at the first congregational church of Berkeley. 700 people pay tickets to come listen to this sort of stuff <laughs> that I say. Every week I do a radio and television show that has been commented nicely on before. The television version now goes to about 55 million American homes. Let me do that again. A weekly discussion of why capitalism stinks goes to 50 million Americans. I don't believe that's ever happened before in American history. Something is going on. Something is very changed. I was explaining, I don't remember, I think it was to We don't get any hate mail. I go around talking like nobody says to me, go back to Moscow, <laughs> or Kami, or any of those charming things that Americans used to say to people like me. It doesn't occur to people. Or if it does, they're afraid to say it in the audience because they kind of know it didn't so cool to say that kind of thing. Once they thought it was terribly cool to say that. No, it isn't so cool. It's changed. Next week, uh, week and a half from now, I go to Richmond, Virginia <laughs> to speak at the behest of William and Mary College, which is a part of the University of Virginia system. The radio station that is the most successful for me is WMNF in Tampa, St. Petersburg, Florida. You get it? It's not what you thought. We are not in the Cold War anymore. The government of the United States, which always has to have a big fat enemy somewhere, otherwise how could we justify the military expenditure, has decided that the big enemy now are Muslims. We're free. They don't bother us much. We can, we can function. Which means my parting thought to you is this. For most of the last 50 years, it was fair for people like us to say, it's very hard for us to function in America between the hostility of the media and the hostility of the, of the government and the hostility, all of that. It's very hard for us to survive, let alone to function. And that's fair enough. That was true. We now have a window like the likes of which we have not had in half a century. If we don't act now, that's on us. We should be doing. I'm here to tell you that everything that has happened to me in the last eight years, the radio program, I'd never done radio in my life. I began in March of 2011 doing a one-hour show at WBAI here in New York. I'm now on 95 sta radio stations across the country and 55 million television sets get the program. I didn't do any of that. I didn't have the staff. I didn't have the money. I didn't. Oh, they all came to us. These are American citizens, millions of them, who figured out more or less what I've been saying. We are not alone. We are not a tiny minority. It would be terrible if they get away with keeping this dead system going. I think that's a great quotation. And that's why the next step is to produce a workplace that is democratic. And there's no mystery. Human beings have figured that out for thousands of years. It's called a worker co-op. It's not, it, there's nothing new to it. We don't have to invent it all over again. That's been done by our foremothers and forefathers. We don't need that. A worker co-op, of which, by the way, there are thousands across the world. So is that your hope, in a way? What that's what I that? work on. What gives you hope? We have, we have a, a normal, we are now an organization. I started doing this all by myself. I am now an organization called Democracy at Work. 
We have two full-time, four part-time people that work with me. Um, unfortunately, it means I have to raise money to pay them. Um, because we can't handle all the work, all the opportunities, all the speaking engagements. But yes, what we go around the country doing is saying, come on, folks, make, the revolution isn't something that happens somewhere else that someone will tell you how to do. It's when people have had it with a system. The American Revolution happened because large numbers of Americans said, that's it. George III, no, no more. And they found this way and that way, oh, we played it, we're very organized. But if you ever study Washington's army, it was a joke. Everybody did their own thing at their own occasion with, with the pitchforks. It was all silly. But when the wind is in your direction historically and you have enough people and they, have, they use their creativity, you win. There's a famous story I can tell you. It's right after the Re Russian Revolution when Lenin, Trotsky, and Stalin, the three big leaders, are sitting somewhere and, a, and one of the people in the revolution comes and says, we just found these, these are the books of the secret police. And they all sit down and they begin opening the book. And Trotsky gets a long face and Stalin gets a long face. And Lenin, looking at them, says, what's the matter? And they said, half the people in the Communist Party were working for the secret police. And then Lenin looks at them and says, yes. But the, the thing to understand is, when the wind is in your direction, it doesn't matter. They lose anyway. It's a very interesting way, kind of the political version of glass half full, glass half empty. It's a way of understanding that when things are moving in your direction, you can make one mistake after another and you still look like a genius. <laughs> Donald Trump was a, a real estate dealer over the last 25 years, a time when real estate values in America went crazy for everybody. He's not a genius, he just sits on a tide that's going up, yeah, he's lucky. right? Silly, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's just silly, and the people who come later will be the ones that we full criticisms because they were on a tide that was going down. This system isn't working. It isn't working for the majority of American people, and they are beginning to figure that out. With each passing month, each passing year, it isn't going to get any better. It isn't going to solve your problem. The tax cut that you were so happy about is going to produce cuts in Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid in the year to come. And then you're going to understand what the cost of this kind of politics is. The people who are doing it hope to be gone with their millions by the time you figure it out. They'll laugh all the way to the bank. This is what they've done before. This is the situation that you're in. Mr. Trump doesn't care what the tariffs are. The, the steel and aluminum companies will now have to support him for fear that if he gives way to another Republican or another Democrat, they'll lose all that money. So he's now got himself these supporters. And Mr. Trump is clever. He will go to the others, the people who lose because of this. Remember the car producers that I told you about? He'll say to them, you want me to get rid of the tariffs? I just put, make it worth my while. They're bidding for him. That's what real estate dealers do. They have buyers bid for the property that they're handling. That's what he's doing. He's doing what he knows how to do. The long-term results of this, long-term, the man is 70. He's out of here. He's gone. Politically, he's gone. Physically, he'll eventually be gone. And it isn't that long a time. Don't forget that. Otherwise, you misunderstand what's going on here. Um, thank you. Yes. I love to listen to you talk, and I feel so um, much smarter after I listen to one of your programs. I'm like, I get it. I totally get it. Um, but I work with kids in the Bronx, and we have a big problem with violence. And so what we, so we try to bring them together, and we try to talk to them about the the underlying systemic racism and like the real what's going on so that somebody benefits from them shooting each other instead of getting mad about the economy and I'm just not smart enough to tell them like I get it when I'm listening to you but then when I go back and I'm trying to tell them <laughs> so uh, is it possible that the people that are part of your team have developed I would love to be able to take this message back and share it so that they can 
feel empowered the way I feel empowered by knowing what's what. And I'm wondering if you have this in a way that I can do that on your website or if there's a way. Yeah, we have these, we have two websites, democracyatwork.info. Mm -hmm. I have little cards here which I will give all of you, which give you all that information. Mm -hmm. um, we have some people, but I don't want you to rely on our people. You have to rely on yourself. You re this is not, you know, I'm not being a motivational speaker here or any of that crap. That's not it. Whatever you have picked up, mm -hmm. go try to convey. Will you do it really well the first time? Maybe not. It'll, and you'll, you'll realize, oh, I didn't get that a point across. Then you'll worry about it. And you know, you're smart, you'll worry about it, you'll do it better the next time. You know, it's like a child daunted by the idea I'm going to get up on that bicycle and then I'm going to fall off, I'm going to hurt myself. And they probably are going to fall off a couple times, they're going to hurt them. And then one day they'll do it and then we'll never figure out how it was back then that they could be scared of something as simple and obvious as getting on a bicycle. That's, if you are bitten by the idea that this can be done, you'll do it. Just do it. Just go out there and do it and stumble and fumble a few times, it's fine. You'll learn how to do it. Besides which, you already know a whole lot of things maybe you couldn't put into words about those kids, about all the things you've absorbed working with them for the last several years. You already have ways of talking that someone coming in from the outside would take months to pick up, if that. So don't sell yourself short. You already have a lot that will enable you to do it now. Sir. Well, thank you very much, I'll repeat. Uh, what about uh, the attack on the continuing attack on unions? Like they were going to the Supreme Court, the Koch brothers. There's this case uh, trying to stop. Janus case. Yes. The, 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 yes, it's famous. And what is your prognosis for the, f the future of the union movement? Uh, I really have to ask you if you want me to be polite or honest. <laughs> well, I don't know. Just explain maybe that. that what does everybody know about this case before the Supreme yeah. Court? The case before the Supreme Court right now is simple, but your, your basic question goes far beyond that. The case right now is the case of uh, Janus is the name of the person, so it's called the Janus case, J-A-N-U-S. It will be decided, I believe, in the next few weeks. Um, and here's how it works. The, the aftermath of, well, let's go back, a little bit of history if you bear with me. The last time capitalism crashed, you will know, 1929, the Great Depression of the 1930s. The worst crash of capitalism so far in its history. Although the one in 2008 is number two, and we don't know quite how that's going to work out. It may yet become number one. We'll see. In this Great Depression, something happened which did not happen after 2008. The American people reacted differently in the 1930s than they did this time. And the difference has to do with organization. In the 1930s, when, remember, 1933, the unemployment rate in the United States is 25%. That's five times what it is now. 25% means one out of every four workers is unemployed. That means every single American family had somebody, an uncle, an aunt, a cousin, a father, a mother, unemployed. There was no unemployment compensation, so that person became a, a dependent on the family, which was already in financial trouble, but now had another person to take care of with no income coming in. It was an unbelievable situation. And the American people in that situation reacted by joining organizations. I can't stress to you how radically different that is from the last 10 years since 2008. What did they join? The most important organization they joined was the labor movement, the labor union. It was the most successful labor union organizing drive in American history. We've never had anything like it before. We've never had anything like it since. In a matter of two to three years, in the middle of the 1930s, millions of Americans joined unions. These were people who had never been in a union before, who came from families where no parents had ever been, or grandparent had ever been in a union. They decided that their best chance of getting through the Depression was to be part of something bigger that would help them, take care of them, support them. So they joined that. Many other people joined two socialist parties, big ones, the American Socialist Party and the Socialist Workers Party. 
Socialist Workers' Party associated with Trotsky, the American Socialist Party with uh, Norman Thomas, named some of you know. And then we had a very big Communist Party in the United States. And most important, the Communists, let me remind you all, Communists and Socialists, there were lots of them all over the United States. I do a quiz with my students. Can you guess which state in the United States had the largest number of socialists elected to the state legislature? New York. Illinois. Ohio. California. Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Nice. Try, try to think about that. Oklahoma. These were not people who quietly said they were socialists. No, they ran on the Socialist Party ticket. Didn't need a big hint to figure out where they were coming from. So we had socialists and communists and unions, and they all worked together. They all worked together a lot and pretty well. And together, they formed an enormous voting bloc, counted in the tens of millions. And they went to the President of the United States, Franklin Roosevelt at that time, and they basically had a tough meeting. And they said to him, you've got to do something for the mass of the American people. Because if you don't, two things will happen. We will not vote for you again, and you won't be the president. And number two, we've got these socialists and communists in the group, and they're telling us that if you don't do this, they're going to make a revolution. You know, like that one in Russia. Mr. Roosevelt took this dreadfully seriously. He had to. There were millions of people here, and they were organized. They could do what their leadership said they would do because they were organized. So he went back to the businessmen and women who run the country. And he told them what had happened. And he said, look, I can't do it for these people because the government has no money. We have a massive unemployment. Nobody has a job. Nobody's paying any income taxes. We don't have any money. But we've got to do it. And I urge you to give me the money because you are the rich. You've got the money. I don't. You've got to give me the money so that I can take care of the mass of people. And I advise you to do that because if you don't, you won't have any money to give anybody. Half of those business people bought it. They agreed with Roosevelt. And remember, if you ever want to understand the time, go back to a library and look at the headlines in the 1934, 35, 36. Every day, massive demonstrations of communists and socialists through Union Square, through Washington Square. There was a time when you would have to have been dead not to understand that this system was shaking to its foundations. So Roosevelt got half of the business community to go with him. That's all he needed. The other half didn't buy it at all. They thought Mr. Roosevelt had been captured by the left. Those are the ancestors of the Koch brothers. And it's literally the same people in many cases. But half was enough for Roosevelt, so he went back to the unions, the socialists, and the communists, and he said, I got a deal. I can do for you. I think I can do for you more than you think I can do for you. But in order for us to have a deal, you've got to stop talking about revolution. You've got to stop talking about communism and socialism. I will give you a government welfare program. Deal, said the socialists and the communists. They went for that. They were dissenters, but they basically went for it. And the unions did too. Now let's see what Mr. Roosevelt did and you'll understand. Number one, first, the social security system. He announced in the middle of the depression, when the government has no money, that there'll be a new program that gives every person 65 years of age or older a check every month for the rest of their life. A government with no money just passed an unbelievably expensive program. No sooner was he done, by the way, we never had a social security program, just so you all know. The social security program started in the depths of the depression. No sooner was that done than he announced the unemployment compensation system. We never had that before either. You lost your job before, you either went to depend on your family or your friends or the local church and you hoped, and you didn't live well. Now the government was gonna say, if you, you lose your job just because there's a bad economy, we will give you a check every week for a year or two to help you 
you know, survive and get along with a government with no money at a time when there are millions of unemployed is, a, is saying, hey, we're going to give you a ton of money. Number three, the first minimum wage in America, passed, same time so that people who got a job weren't paid so little that it almost was like not having a job. And then the big one, I left to the last, government jobs. Roosevelt goes on the radio and says, if, almost these words, not quite, but almost, if the private capitalist se sector of our economy cannot provide jobs to the millions of Americans who ask for nothing other than a chance to do a job, then I, as president, will do it. And from 1934 to 1941, 15 million jobs were created by the government, working for the government, for those people who therefore didn't have to go on welfare, who therefore could maintain their mortgage payments and hold on to their house, who had the self-esteem that comes from that. By the way, if you travel the United States, you can see all over the United States the effects of the work that those people did. The first conservation, ecological conservation, was done by them. They decorated half the, the monuments in this country. The WPA, some of you know about that program, where the government hired unemployed artists and made them into troops of singers and dancers and painters and sent them all over the United States to bring culture to the mass of people. What an interesting idea. Use unemployment. These things cost a fortune of money. Where did the money come from? This is the best part, folks. Roosevelt taxed the corporations and the rich. Big time. He took their money to support the mass of old people, unemployed people, in the ways I've just described to you. If you talk to leading Republicans and Democrats today and you ask them to do anything, they'll look at you as if you've lost your mind and explain to you that that's not doable. You can't do that. You could never do that. That's, that's not politically possible. Roosevelt did it. And the interesting thing is, he's the most popular president the United States <laughs> ever had. He was reelected three times. No president came close to that. The one president who taxed corporations and the rich didn't lose his political position. <laughs> By doing that, he cemented it. Imagine had Obama taken the moment in the early part of 2009 when he just comes into office and said, I'm doing that. What he might have become as opposed to what he did become. Think about it. Well, now I can answer the gentleman's question. When the war was over and Roosevelt dead in 1945, the business community that hated having to pay the taxes to take care of average people said to themselves, we've got to undo this thing that was called the New Deal. That was the name of it. And they weren't stupid. They knew the New Deal didn't depend on one politician, even a popular one like Roosevelt. They understood that what made Roosevelt do that was the coalition of unions, socialists, and communists. So they understood that coalition has to be broken and smashed. So this can never happen again. So they asked themselves the question, this is your history, folks. If you've never heard this before, that, that should tell you something about your education. To figure out what's the weak link in this call. Who do we go after first? Answer the Communist Party. We have to change their image from being the leading militant activists to being agents of a foreign power. That's what they did. They transformed communists from the leaders, which they were, into the evil fifth column of the Soviet Union. And on that basis, imprisoned them, deported them, demonized them. And when they were done, they went across the United States, and they said, you know, socialists, that's the same thing as communists, they just spell it differently. And then they did the same to them. And when they were done, they went after the last part of the coalition, and that's the gentleman's question, the labor movement. And the first thing they did, 1947, two years after Roosevelt died, they passed a bill called the Taft-Hartley Act. This act had the following component to it. And again, if you don't know this, really, 
it tells you about your education. In that bill, the following clause applies. Any gain won by any union in any workplace must be given to every worker in that workplace, whether or not that worker is a member of the union, whether or not that worker pays any dues to the union. In other words, it's a bill specifically designed to create what some people call the free rider program, a situation in which every worker is supposed to say to himself, why should I join the union? Why should I pay dues? Because whatever the union wins, I get it anyway. So if there's a strike, I'm not going to go out and lose pay, because if they win, I get it. If they lose, I at least don't lose because I, didn't, I never joined. It's a way to destroy the union movement. And they've been doing that ever since. And the labor movement, to be fair, has been on the wrong end of this, these laws and this struggle. But they have not come up with a counter strategy. A strategy. If you look at the membership of labor unions in the United States, for 50 years it's a declining line without exception. Any other organization would have said, my goodness, whatever we're doing isn't working. We need a dramatic change of strategy. But they never did. The unions were confronted by a government and a business community that attacked the communists, who were often their leaders, attacked the socialists, who were often their leaders. It traumatized the union movement. They felt they had to keep away from socialists and communists forever, lest the government come and smash them again. Which is why to this day, if you reveal in many unions that you're a socialist or a Marxist or something, people back away from you as if you had a you know, sexually transmitted disease. They're afraid. But if you want my honest opinion, at this point, they look like they're going to disappear. The shrinkage of the American labor movement is unbelievable, unrelieved, and there is no internal questioning that opens themselves up to thinking radically new ways to try to avoid this. It's really, it's tragic, and of course it makes it easier for the people who run this economy to get the things they want. Come on, if you had a live labor movement, it would have reacted to that tax bill in December by going into the streets by the millions. Are you crazy? Everybody, including Trump, had said the declining middle class is a great problem in America. The growing inequality of wealth and income in America is a big problem. Well, if it's a big problem, you just passed a tax bill that makes that worse. We won't allow it. That would have been, that would have shaken the country up. Nothing. You have democratic politicians saying, not a good idea. <laughs> okay, that's it, that's it. Who cares? They run right across them. Go ahead, Karen, please. Hmm. I just want to ask you a question. How do you filter in global warming to the economic analysis? Because when I think of something like planned obsolescence, which is widespread, I mean, when they create, when they create washing machines these days, they know that they're going to last for yeah, six years, right? And they, they scale that back. But there's a lot of metal, there's a lot of plastic, there's a lot of wiring, and all that stuff goes ultimately in the garbage. Um, the utilization of plastics, you know, uh, apparently there, there are continent size um, flotillas in the, in the oceans um, of, of, of plastic that has collected together. So I mean, it seems to me that in some ways, there are such enormous, in, in order to get a, a, a grip on where we're at, there are certain enormous changes that have to take place which would almost have to take place internationally. So it's, it's, it just seems to, to complicate every problem enormously. And I just wonder how you deal with it, or if you deal with it sort of at all. Sure. I'll deal with it this way. First, yeah, all these problems are international now. But the United States remains a very large part of the world economy. If we do it here, it'll be much easier to do it in many, many other places. And they'll, the people there are itching to do it anyway. If the United States had changes of the kind we're talking about, 
it would be the best possible support for those changes to become international uh, that we could hope for. Just imagine yourself in a different country, a smaller one, a France or a Nigeria or a Malaysia. I mean, it's a comp there you can literally say, my God, we are a small part of this, but the United States is not a small part of this. As to the whole notion of global warming, look, we have allowed, let's take the Koch brothers, it's always fun to, to attack them. Um, these folks have tens of billions of dollars. We've allowed these two brothers, in this case, to amass between them, I don't know, a hundred billion dollars or whatever it is. And they're not stupid, they understand that in a society where you have that kind of inequality, people who have tens of billions of dollars, that sooner or later the mass of people who don't have enough are going to cast an envious eye upon them. And after they cast the eye, they're going to ask themselves the question, how could we offset this, reverse this? And then they're going to figure out, because it's well known, that they have something called the majority of the voters. The majority of the voters don't have anything. A tiny minority of the voters have most of it, like the Koch brothers, or like Jeff Bezos of Amazon, so on. So then the question becomes, gee, the mass of people, if they got together, could use the power of the vote to undo the inequality produced by a capitalist economy. The rich understand this perfectly well. And that's why they have to buy the political system. They have to make sure that the people who run that system, the leaders of the political parties and so on, understand that cannot happen, period. I don't know how many of you saw this wonderful moment towards the end of the campaign in 2016 when um, Mrs. Pelosi, the Democratic leader from California, was giving a talk and a young in a college and a student stood up and said to her something like, uh, there's been a lot of criticism of capitalism, what do you feel about that? And you should, it's wonderful to see the video. You see the consternation on her face. She has no idea what he's talking about. And she fumbles and it's kind of embarrassing. And she ends up saying, well, you know, uh, we're all capitalists. And she sits down. But the answer is, that's exactly right. She understands better than she knows what her job is. That's why the Koch brothers spend all that money, roughly a billion a year now, buying the political engines, the political leaderships, the parties, the, the lobbyists, the whole apparatus to make sure that we don't use the political power to undo the inequality that capitalism has allowed them to get. And therefore, for example, the Koch brothers don't want anti-fossil fuel. That's their business. That's how they grew wealthy. They don't want that. They've got to make sure that that doesn't happen. So they buy all the politicians who keep that off the agenda. It's a little bit like what you're seeing today. The NRA buys the politicians to make sure that we can all buy assault rifles, you know, at the local Walmart when we're in a bad mood or something. You know, it does, it, this, in America, it's so far gone that it's transparent. Everybody knows. You know that famous song of Leonard Cohen? I assume many of you know. has a famous song called Everybody Knows. Just go Google it. Listen to it. It's magnificent. It's his explaining to us that, of course, we do know all of this stuff. We need an occasional booster shot from somebody or something to remind us of what we know, to overcome our fear of acting on what we know, but we do know. Sir, that's Karl Marx there. Back, <laughs> 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 it's Rick. Yeah, I'll speak in English. <laughs> uh, so, He's another Rick. Uh, I've heard you many times at the Brick Forum and, and New School and Judson here. Uh, thank you so much. So you said that if we democratize the workplace, then the workers won't be, their jobs won't be outsourced, their wages won't be reduced, Jerry Diamond won't be given a $20 billion, million dollar bonus. 
Uh, but it's still a competitive enterprise. What about the very nature of the product or service that's being produced when it's inherently a bad thing, say tobacco or firearms or some other form of consumer junk, then aren't the workers just ensnared in the need to make the organism uh, survive even though now the decision making is distributed throughout the entire uh, company to include them. How, how do we uh, purify the system so that the product or service becomes better and doesn't produce the plastic uh, thing that we need? Crap. Yeah. Crap. Yeah. Yeah. Crap. Um, the two ways to answer. The first is to cooperatize or democratize the workplace is not some magic wand which if we wait it, all the problems will be solved, all the difficulties will be overcome. It's a little bit like saying in a slave a period of slavery, let's get rid of slavery. If we get rid of slavery, we don't make all people lo lovely human beings who treat each other with respect and love the way they ought to. But it is an important step to take and we are clearly in favor of getting rid of slavery. This is the same thing. The step to cooperatize the enterprise is an important step forward in human development and human history. It doesn't solve all the problems. So let me get to the one you raise, and you're absolutely right, and I think everybody knows that too. We should not have been ever in the position of confusing protecting and saving the worker from protecting and saving the job. The thing we need as a society is to protect all of us. If we are engaged in something that we as a community think is useless, like guns or, or, or uh, you know, toasters that sing songs to us in the morning, uh, then we should be able to say, that shouldn't be produced. We don't need that job. But that should have nothing to do with guaranteeing the income and the work and the life of the people. The job of a rational society would be to say, of course we need to make decisions what we want more of, what we want less of, and what we want nothing of. But that is a separate matter from saying, of course we will take care of these people who used to do that thing we don't want anymore. We will give them an income over a transition period. We will get them a new job, train them in something which we want more of, so we get this transition done. A rational society would have done that long ago. And we would have to do that. And my guess is to democratize the workplace would be to take a step in that direction too. Because workers have as one of the most important issues, you all know this, the security of their job and their income. They've made all kinds of commitments based on that. They've made all kinds of promises to themselves and the people around them. Helping people to be secure in their life situation is something we say to ourselves we do from the minute the baby's born to try to give that infant a sense that the food is there when it, when it needs it and the warmth is there and the love is there that doesn't stop the needs for those things ever until you're dead why don't we do this as, a, as a, an adult community of course the mistake we did was always to think that the only way to secure a person's income is to secure that person's job. That was never true. That was never, ever true. I'll give you a concrete example. The most successful worker co-op in the world is something called the Mondragon Cooperative Corporation. A, a big operation in Spain. I can see some of you know about it. Uh, it's about 60, 70 years old. It started in the mid-50s by a Roman Catholic priest in the north of Spain, a man named Father Arismendi, very famous uh, in Spanish history. Started with six workers. Uh, he made a famous speech, a joke, to his parish there. It's in the Basque country. It's in the foothills of the Pyrenees Mountains that separate uh, France from Spain. So he makes this speech to his little parish. It, by the way, very poor part of Spain. And Spain had just come out of the Spanish Civil War, which was very destructive, and then the Second World War. So this was a poor part of Spain, poorer than even normal. So he makes his speech, he says, if we wait for a capitalist employer to come here and hire us, we will all die of old age before that happens. Ha ha ha. 
So what we have to do is we have to be our own employer. In other words, we will set up a co-op where we hire ourselves. And he starts with six workers, all right, 1956. So now we are 2018. Uh, the Mondragon Corporation is now the seventh largest corporation in all of Spain. It has an excess of 100,000 employees. Uh, a good half or more of them are in co-ops, uh, where all decisions are made collectively. Uh, and this has a number of interesting consequences. Number one, you, I only say this because I, I think some of you will enjoy it. Once a year, the workers get together and they assess the supervisors. And they decide whether they did a good job or a bad job. And if they did a bad job, they get fired. Let me do this again. The workers fire the supervisors. You live in a society which runs that in reverse. Second decision they made years ago. The highest paid worker cannot get more than six or eight times what the lowest paid worker does. Here in the United States, the ratio is about 300 to 1. So, if you want to deal with unequal income and wealth, here's how you do it like that. They did it. They showed us. If you go to Mondragon, it's a little city, you'll see right away there are no beggars. They don't have the extremes of inequality that we have all around us here in New York. They figured out a way to solve that. But here's the third one. They decided that if something is being produced by a co-op that, that is not wanted anymore, that is not desirable, they simply stop. And the community as a whole, the corporation as a whole, finds the kinds of work that are needed and shifts those people with whatever training and so forth they need from what is not needed. To, but supporting them and securing their income, that's never in question. That's a commitment that the community has. It's a little bit like a family, right? So if mother loses her job, we don't say, okay, you, you live on bread and water now for the next six months. We continue to give her her plate at the dinner because the alternative is unthinkable. Well, you know, there's no reason why that cannot be generalized and become a social commitment that goes without saying it has nothing to do. We don't need to have a one-to-one -one dependency linkage between the job you do and the income you earn. If the job isn't wanted, you do a different one. This is not rocket science, folks. Again, the family. If, if, if we don't need gardening of the tulips in the back, then spend that hour you used to do on the tulips by you know, cutting the hedges or something else because you're still going to do your share of the family's work, but you'll do something more desirable for the family rather than less. This, ooh, this is not complicated. Unless you are fixated in your mind that the only way you will ever give a person an income is if he or she does that job. Then of course you make people crazy. Then of course they want to hold on to whatever job they have because you've made it the only source of their income. It's the same thing with technology. When you have a new technology come in that makes workers more productive, how do you handle that in our society, in capitalism? Point home, because it'll help a lot of you. Suppose you have a machine that makes every worker twice as productive as they were before. So you used to have 100 workers to produce your output, and you sold it, you're a capitalist. Now you buy a machine, or you replace an old machine with a new machine that makes your workers twice as productive. They can produce twice as much. Okay, what does the capitalist do? Very simple, he fires half his workforce. He has 100 workers, he fires 50. What does he need them for? With the 50 that remain, each one being twice as productive as before, he sells this, he produces the same number of goods, he sells them, he earns just as much as he did before, but now he doesn't have to take all that money he used to pay the 50 workers that he fired, and he keeps it for himself. Technological advance, good for his profits, bad for those 50 workers and their families who are screwed. Okay, that's how capitalism works. If you know that, you can't be surprised that workers hold back. We don't want this technology, we don't want these new machines, because they feel threatened. Why do they feel threatened? Because they are. 
Well, what would a worker co-op do? Real simple. Wow, you have machines that are twice as productive. You don't fire anybody. <coughs> you cut the workday in half. Uh -huh. Everybody keeps their job, works half the hours they used to, produces as much in half the hours as before they took double the hours, and now you have a technical art that produces the same number of goods, sells them for the same amount of money, whatever profits the capitalist made before, he makes again, he pays the workers exactly what he paid. Everything is the same. The real benefit is the workers have half their time off. That's technology that benefits the majority, the workers. In capitalism, technology benefits profits, which go to a tiny minority of the population. The problem has never been technology. The problem has always been capitalism. The way it works uses technology to screw large numbers of people for the profit of a few. That's not necessary. That's not built into the technology. I just gave you an example where the same profit would be earned, the same number of goods produced, the same output, the same rep, everything is the same, except that the workers have half a day to work, and now have half a day to bond with their children, to have better relations with their husbands and wives, to become artistic and creative, in other words, to live more humane and human lives. Now I ask you, whatever ethics you believe in and morality, what should technology have always done is it to make more profits, or is it to make more leisure? You know, every big technological breakthrough was justified on the grounds that it will save human beings from drudgery and all of that. And we live at a time when workers are doing more hours a week of work than ever. You ever wonder why the promise of technology has been so systematically betrayed? Don't wonder any longer. You live in a system that seeks and implements technology to make more profits, which it has done for them. But for the rest of us, no. One thing you haven't addressed, I'm wondering about, uh, because I worked in the New York City public school system for 30 years. And what I witnessed is the opposite of what you described as the solution. Rather than come to us teachers, this is why I had to get out, and say, okay, what do you guys think? We were given people who were supposedly trained to come in and tell us what to do, and come in with 10-page evaluations where they evaluated us, not we evaluated them, and things like this. It just got to a point where I said, you know, after 30 years, I think I, I, think I gotta stop doing this, because I'm gonna do something, and it's not gonna be nice. It might get crazy. So. What I'm saying is, in a society where we have a, a public system or a school system that's supposedly supported by the government, it's free, so on and so forth, what, how do we work it so that the kids aren't exposed to just test becoming, you know, test products of the testing system and the workers, the teachers are not top down being ordered to do impossible things and constantly being reevaluated? And it just becomes. I just see it assume it's going to blow up if it hasn't. And we have a supposedly progressive mayor who just appointed a new chancellor who said, you know, I don't think I want to do this. And I can understand exactly. He seemed to have changed his mind overnight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so how, do we, how do we work out of that? Well, again, I hate to, to beat the same drum, but then again, that's the drum I know how to beat. Um, the question is, what is public education for? What, what is it you want it to be? What it is you want it to do? If you understood the things I said to you before about capitalists leaving the United States, just stay with me on that for five minutes. Starting in the 1970s, capitalists can make more money, pay lower wages, get out of environmental laws and rules by producing in China or India or Brazil or wherever they go. Okay. Now, follow the logic. A company that goes abroad discovers it's much more profitable to produce over there and ship the stuff back here, begins to understand that it has no need for public services here in the United States the way it used to. See, it used to hire its engineers, its managers, its supervisors, its skilled workers here. 
And it wanted those people to be literate, it wanted those people to be disciplined, it wanted those people to have a whole lot of qualities that they wouldn't have to spend money developing in those workers. Made sense. So you could finally go to them and say, look, pay some taxes so we can have an institution that prepares what you want us to deliver to you. But now this company is producing in New York. It closed its last factory in Long Island City. It's in China now, or Brazil, or India. It doesn't need the public school system. It doesn't want to spend money on an institution it doesn't need. Do you know where most of the endowed chairs in universities are being paid for by American corporations? Over there. They're not creating any new endowed chairs at the new school. No. They're creating them at the University of Hyderabad, or the University of Beijing, or the University of Sao Paulo, Dubai. or Dubai, and all those places. Mm -hmm. They need, because you can get an engineer in India and pay him seven to $12,000 a year, and he's a very rich man or woman. Here, you offer that to an engineer, they start laughing at you in a not nice way. They understand that, but that means they need to develop the education system over there, not here. And you're seeing these companies moving their expenditures. They, they don't want to support you. But of course they can't say that because that's my job. I say that. I want you to see it. They need you not to see it. Why? Because then is the then the moment comes when the teachers realize they're being screwed, the parents realize they're being screwed, the kids realize they have no future, this builds the possibility of the alliance that can make things change. They don't want that. They need to find scapegoats. The teachers aren't doing their job, or the administrator is screwing up, or the children come from impossible homes. You know, because you're surrounded by these arguments. These arguments have a fundamental function. Don't look at the systemic problems that underlie these crises. Let the teachers quit because they can't stand it, or get on each other's nerves because the tension is too high, or take it out on the children, which makes other teachers angry at them. You can see it. It's a disintegration that destroys all these folks, undercuts the educational system, and you have to ask yourself the question, if it was necessary for American capitalism from the middle of the 19th century to recently to have a public school system and to spend a lot of money on it, it's the biggest expenditure for most municipalities, public education. So they spend a lot of money on that. Why would they now not want to do that anymore? Why are they closing schools? By the way, if you're, if you're not aware of it, the biggest struggle is actually in Chicago where the confrontation between the mass of people and this Rahm Emanuel mayor, who's the guy who's is knocking it down, is as vicious and as socially destructive as you can imagine, with heavy racial overtones. It's really bad. Uh, but it's happening all over the country. It's like hospitals that are closing. Brooklyn has got half a dozen hospitals that are this close to closing, leaving their communities with you know, un unspeakable distances to go if you have a crisis of some sort in your health. What is going on? It, the businesses have left. <laughs> it is so hard for Americans to get this. They left you. Do you understand? The businesses left. They can make more money somewhere else. And they're not going to pave your roads or teach your children or do anything with their money that isn't helpful to their project that they're caught up in, which is profit maximization. That's what they're going to do. And that means they're going to do it over there. They're not going to do it here. And, and you're going to be fine. Debt, so what? And we go into yes. debt to pay them to do it to us. And we're going to go bankrupt. <laughs> What's that? And we got our country in a going bankrupt. Yes. Bankrupt here, yeah. I guess we should. Oh yeah, you should. Go on. One more? Yeah, yeah. sure. I'm just saying we are so riveted to you. It's 10:15. Normally yeah. we're out of here by. This is great. No. <laughs> can, 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 can I have these little cards and tell no, them about no, what we do? Right. Oh, just, if we'll someone, if you could just take one and hand it around. Pages. That way you can follow what we're doing. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. 
Well, there was a lady there. Yeah, she was asking this, this lady, and then there was one there. A sleepover. Your wife is asking a question. Yes, yes. Yeah, go ahead. You have uh, honors, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. yes. You have been talking so much about you know, the disruption of the, of the union and all these other jobs in this country and around the world. But one of the things that I, uh, I know that you mentioned and we want to question a little bit about, um, about jobs and when people do certain jobs, then they pay. And okay. That's the idea that, that um, our capital is included to people. But you, um, I just wanted to know if you believe on the new universal basic income. And what do you think about that? Because right now I see, and I just mentioned the school system in Chicago and how we're coming so racial, and the racial uh, 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 problem in this country is getting bigger and bigger, and we're getting very, very divided. I just heard um, that a study was done, I just heard about two days ago that a study was done that right now, um, the brown and black people, we are getting so separated from the vocation that we are not getting together, and I'm really, really worried about what is going to happen right now if we don't come together and fight this system. But I just wanted to, it's, it's about two, almost two questions at the okay. same time. No, I read the same studies. The studies are, I hope you're all aware of it. Um, the gap between white and black and brown is worse than it was 30 years ago. The, the whole interim period of overcoming our racial divide, all bullshit. That's a technical term. <laughs> uh, it didn't work, it didn't succeed, it's worse than it ever was. Again, I would point you, take a look at Chicago, because Chicago is in a sense at the edge of this cat catastrophic uh, splitting of the United States. Part of the reason you get from Trump the white supremacy is because he too, in his way, for his reasons, reacts to this situation, it's becoming a political ploy to identify with the whiteness again, the way it once was in American politics, because the interim didn't work and Obama didn't solve the problem uh, either. So that's one point. On the universal basic income, there's two things going on there. One is a recognition, confusedly, of what I've been trying to tell you, that the system is falling apart and if you keep link, linking people's income to their jobs while you destroy the jobs in every way you can, you are heading into catastrophe. What are you going to do? You know, it's the worry of a system that uses technology the way I described to you. We are now faced with a new technology, you know, self-driving automobile, self-driving uh, machinery, drones in the air and uh, vehicles. Well, you know, three or four million Americans are truck drivers. That's gone. Another two or three million are Lyft and Uber and taxi drivers. That's gone. If they have air taxis, that's going to do all kinds of other things. There's no preparation in this. There's nothing. There's nothing except a few people saying, hey, I can see this coming. This is going to be real a big problem in America. We have no work for these people. We have no jobs. We have a system that will fire them rather than reduce their time, the way I, all of that. So we have a recognition. We've got to do something. So the idea of a universal basic income, that, that basically we say to people, if you don't have a job here, we're going to give you this minimum. And that way, at least you won't be a person who has nothing to lose. You have something to lose. We're going to give you something which, if you don't behave correctly, we will withdraw. You can smell it coming. There's another force for it. When you add up the costs of the 800 different welfare programs we have, and the people that need to be hired to administer them, if you sit down with a pad and paper, Giving everybody $30,000 a year is cheaper than that. That's the irony of it all. The chaos and the mess that we've made of these things has actually created a situation where right-wingers will become in favor of this 
because, and the business community may be won over, because it's less money for them to have to pay to sustain the part of the population they don't care about anymore than the, what do we have now. And then there's finally a problem. Some of you may be attracted to the notion that everybody has a minimum. I understand that. I understand, I share that. But here's a very, very serious problem. A society which would work in such a way as to have a big group of people who earn an income by working, and another big group of income of people who earn an income who don't work, that's not a sustainable arrangement. The bitterness, the anger, the resentment of those who work and get will tempt many a sleazoid politician to do what you can imagine they will do with that kind of a situation. Far better to share it out. Everybody has a job, maybe only two hours a week or two hours a day, but don't make some of us work and others of us not. If we're gonna have an income for everybody, then let us have all of us have a commitment to do our part, some contribution to what has to be done in a community. The way a good and reasonable community of people would do anyway. Don't do, don't create some like we do today, those who work overtime and those who have no job at all. That's irrational, socially divisive. It's a sign of capitalism, but it is not a way for human communities to exist. Yes, and then yeah. we are gonna stop. Yeah. Okay, I, 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 I wanna put it into words, it's hard to do. In the old days, you know, one person had a farm, like Farmer Brown, and then they had their acres, and then the next neighbor had <coughs> acres, and then the next neighbor had their acres. And the acres were set out like sheets on a table. And you could be the king of your castle or each, and it was usually the man. The man was the king of his acreage. And he had a little family. But there was some sense of pride. You had a sense of pride and, and some boundaries and some ownership of, of what you could do. In Maybe in other places it was the factory. You went to the factory and you did your thing and you came back. But you had a sense of pride. Now, what, is, what I understand is happening is that even if you say Coca-Cola, for instance, Coca-Cola doesn't just want the United States anymore. Coca-Cola wants the globe. So in order for Coca-Cola to take over the globe, the USA is going to come down in its um, importance because we're, not, we're in China now. We're in Russia now. We're in whatever that is now. And this, this USA, eh, why? Maybe my great grandparents were from the USA, maybe my grandmother's, maybe I was even born in the USA, but that was 20 years ago. I'm in India now. So there is absolutely no incentive, no motivation to build up the basic pride of the basic American and in fact, when you open up, it's everything. Oh, I was shot. Oh, I was on drugs. Oh, I was a prostitute. Oh, you, you, can't, you can't attack the defamation of America. It, then it, and then it was Santa Con. That wasn't enough, but then they had to have Santa Claus puking in the streets. The, the defamation of, of America and all we hold dear, for those of us who held it dear, is, has been painful. And that's all I can tell you. And then you see the empty stores, and then you see the people lying in the gutter. And you wonder, which would be better, India or Missouri? Good point. India's looking pretty good. Yeah, no, and I'm, I'm afraid that all I've got to tell you is, at this point, the only thing that could stop that process from continuing is a massive refusal of the United States' people yeah. to allow it. Short of that, Capitalists are going to do what their competitive structure has them do, and that is leave this country the way they've been doing for 40 years, automate the jobs out of existence, bring in the cheap immigrants. If there's an upwelling of American anger, as there has been, but if it has been cleverly directed to be anti-immigrant, great. We will exp Obama threw a 3 million out of the country, roughly, and Mr. Trump is on his way to throwing out more. If this satisfies the angry people, it will change nothing in the dynamic we've been talking about. Nothing. But it will give you some sense 
a demand is doing something. See, he's pushing those immigrants out. It's a scapegoat mechanism, and it gives them another few years. If the anger of Americans were directed not at that sca this scapegoat or whoever the next scapegoat is, but instead at a system that's working this way, then we could have change. But if we don't do that, then we will exhaust ourselves in a, in a rage against the wrong target, which will either lead to explosions of the, of, by the way, that's a neighbor of ours, Mexico. To have a destroyed society right on your border, that's not smart. That's going to cause, and that will lead people to say, oh, we shouldn't do that anymore. Let, let's let them come again. So we'll reverse the policy. Years are going by in which we're not changing anything. We're wasting our time. It, on the other point, that's, a, that's the denial again. You're absolutely, the United States is becoming less and less important. Everybody who pays any attention, China is the next. China's the new empire. China's the new government of everything. And I, so, yeah. and I think Trump Americans don't want to face it. It's part of that as well. Yeah, they just, Nobody respects it. They don't want to face it. They don't want to deal with it. They want somebody, look, what was the slogan? Make America great again. It's the recognition that we are, something bad is happening. Let's get this guy in who's with magic going to bring us back. The only magic is that he got enough Americans to believe that silliness Maybe to we give them more break. time. I'm sorry to interrupt you there because this has been so tremendous. We, we have some snacks downstairs for anybody who can oh stay. It's late. But I want to